Okay, we'll close the poll and share it. So first question, what type of engines, types of engines are typically used on modern commercial transport ports? Turbojet, ramjet, piston prop, turboprop, turboshaft, and turbofan. So I, all of you who, who responded obviously didn't choose ramjet. There are no civil transport aircraft that use ramjets. Um, they've really been used almost exclusively for missiles. There have been a couple um, military manned aircraft that have used them, but used primarily for missiles. Um, turboprop and piston prop, or turbojet and piston prop, the first and the third answer, they are obviously have a long history in commercial transports. Piston prop was all the rage from the 1920s into the 1950s. Um, and then was replaced by turbojets, but they've both fallen out of favor. And the, only, the last um, operating well-known Western civil transport with a turbojet was Concorde. And, um, every other one had gone out of service at that point or had been re-engined with turbo fans. Uh, turboprops are real common on regional aircraft and still to this day, we see turbo shafts on helicopters and the like. So they're not on our fixed wing aircraft. Um, as a primary rule, um, they are turboprops in that case where we do get a little bit of thrust from the jet. And then of course, by far the most common, and as you all chose, uh, turbofan is the most common. Uh, so, and we see that in our options here with our turbofan and our turboprop. We'll talk a little bit more about prop fan uh, towards the end of this. Um, what's the purpose of the nacelle? Um, to hide the engine, Provide aerodynamic fairing, allow air to enter the engine, allow exhaust to exit the engine or attach the engine to the aircraft. And 35% of you said provide aerodynamic fairing. The nacelle, which you can see here, is to fair the engine on the outside. It covers all of the piping and wiring and all of that on the outside of the engine. Now, as part of the nacelle, we have an inlet and a nozzle. We call that the nose cowl for the inlet and then the, just the nozzle. Um, at the back. However, <clears throat> that's not unique to the nacelle. If your engines are buried in the wing, a la um, Comet, you would still have those. Um, so then it's not unique to the cell. And of course, attaching the engine to the aircraft is what? what? What do we use to attach the engine to the aircraft? Yeah, pylons. So on installation, we have our pylons, as you can see here. And then the horizontal pylon here on the 727. Um, obviously buried engines don't necessarily use pylons. Okay, number three, what is the relationship between specific thrust and TSFC or thrust specific fuel consumption? As specific thrust increases, TFC, TSFC improves. As specific thrust increases, TSFC remains constant. As specific thrust decreases, TSFC worsens. As specific thrust decreases, TF TSFC improves, or there is no relationship. Now, this is a bit of a trick one because two of these are actually the same thing. The second one and the last one is no relationship. Um, and 40% of you put that as we decrease specific thrust, our TSFC improves. And the reason for that in general, we can always create um, combinations where this doesn't work. But in general, the reason that as TSFC, as specific thrust, decreases, TSFC improves, is we're moving a lot more air um, at a lower velocity to get the same amount of thrust. And that means that we have to put less kinetic energy into that air. So we get more of the energy is used to create thrust from our fuel than otherwise. Now, as we said, there's a bit of a trade there because for that to work, you need to have higher energy cores in your turbofans. That means you need to have cores that are more compact that put a lot more energy into the working fluid that they're gonna extract through the turbine and the like. But in general, we drive down specific thrust by driving up bypass ratio and we drive and we improve TSFC, okay? What technology component limits the overall pressure ratio of an engine? The maximum stage pressurize, compressor cooling channels, compressor materials, bearing strength, turbine materials, or turbine cooling channels. So you all did focus in that it is the compressor that drives the compressor, the overall pressure ratio. We are compressing the air. And as we compress the air, we increase the temperature of that air. 
And therefore, as we get to the very end stage with the highest pressure ratio, we're going to have the highest temperature, and that's what's going to limit it. We cannot put cooling channels in the compressor. Why? What are some of the reasons? Anybody know the reasons we can't put cooling channels in our compressor blades? Anyone want to hazard a guess? First reason is where do you get the cooling from? You have to be able to put and press it, high pressure air through it. We're already at the highest pressure. We're at a temperature there. So it works really well if we take air off the compressor at that stage, route it around the combustor and into the turbine, but we can't do that for, um, for, for cooling compressors. The other reason is our compressor blades are really, really thin. A turbine blade can be quite thick because of what it's doing, but compressor blades are really, really thin. There's just no space for it. So you're absolutely right. Those of you who said there's no space for it, no room for it, that's absolutely the case. So when that happens, if our materials can't take it, we can't cool them, they melt, we can't drive up the pressure ratio. Now, maximum stage rise is a bit of a, a, a big thing because yes, that will create some limit because we can only have too many so many stages because of weight, but it's not an absolute technology limit like materials are. Obviously bearing strengths and then turbine materials and turbine cooling is all after the combustor. So that brings in overall pressure ratio and turbine entry temperature in that combination. Number five, what happens if you increase overall pressure ratio without increasing turbine entry temperature? Um, one, you melt the compressor, two, you melt your turbine, three, you can't add enough fuel, and four, you have to add too much fuel. So remember, as we increase overall pressure ratio, we compress the air more, we raise the temperature of the air. If we do work on, on a fluid, it raises that temperature. Turbine exit or, or combustor exit or turbine in entry or turbine inlet temperature is the temperature on the other side of the compressor. If we don't raise that temperature, the, the amount of temperature difference we get from the entrance to the combustor, the exit of the combustor isn't very high. And the only way that means is we can't add fuel, we can't burn fuel. Now, what that means is if you don't do it in the right balance, overall pressure ratio and turbine entry temperature, you won't get the most efficient use of all that work you put into the air, the fluid going through the compressor. There's an optimal point based on the pressure rise for temperature rise. So you have to do those two in concert. As you drive both of those upwards, overall pressure ratio and turbine entry temperature, you can make a more efficient core. You can extract more power out of that core, drive a bigger fan and create thrust with a higher bypass ratio, lower F um, and then more efficient engine, okay? So the answer is you can't add enough fuel to make the most ideal use of the fluid. If we don't raise overall pressure ratio, that stays low and we just raise turbine entry temperature, we're not compressing the air enough, we're gonna get a lot more losses in heat addition, um, we're burning a lot more fuel and we want to get the same energy out. So it's a balance of the two things that you need. You can't focus on one or the other alone, you have to do them together. Okay, back to the open rotor prop fan. Why are open rotor prop fan propulsion systems not particularly popular? And I mean not particularly popular in that no one uses them. We have turbo props, but we don't have open rotor prop fans. So if we go back and look here at the basic engine choices, you do not see these prop fans in regular service. They just don't exist. They've done them in experimental operations, but that's the extent of it. Is it because they have a lower top speed, because they're noisier, lower fuel prices, quieter, or higher fuel prices? Remember, looking at this graph, a prop fan is more efficient over a large range of speeds than a turbofan, i.e. it will burn less fuel. So obviously, higher fuel prices would drive us towards a prop fan. So why aren't we using them? Well, one, fuel prices, every time they go up, come back down again, and they come back down again such that that risk and that investment may not be worth it. But the biggest problem is noise because we don't have a duct. We don't have, we have tip noise, tip losses that create buzzing noise. And that's the big trade. If fuel prices are really, really high, we're gonna want to save money on fuel and we'll pay a penalty in noise. Maybe 
retrofitting people's houses and the like. But if fuel prices are low, we don't want to pay that penalty. So we're not going to use it. So a combination of natural risk aversion plus fuel prices that don't tend to go up you know, indefinitely. Yes, they go up that way over time, but in short periods of time, we just haven't overcome the noise. Ideally, you want to fly them a little bit slower than you fly the same turbofan. That's where the most optimal condition is in terms of fuel and stuff, but we're not talking a big difference. It's not the difference between a turbofan and a turboprop per se. So a question, with a prop fan, is, is it still limited by shock at the tips? So not as efficient on long range. So yes, prop fans are limited by shock at the tips, but you'll notice they have a smaller diameter than turboprops. And what you'll do is you just operate it so that it's at that point during cruise, it's not got shocks at the tips. Now, Here's a, a bit of thing. If next time you fly, if you ever get a chance on a commercial aircraft, listen on takeoff. Do you hear a buzzing sound from the engine? If you do, and not all engines do this, and especially not the engines on the A320 Neo series or on the 737 MAX, but some engines do. If you hear that, that means the tips have gone supersonic. And that's okay for takeoff because yes, it's less efficient, but it's not about efficiency on takeoff, it's about thrust. So we're willing to trade efficiency on takeoff to get thrust, but you wouldn't want that through the rest of your climb and your cruise. So yeah, you do, that is part of the reason that we don't get, we can't fly as fast that the efficiency really drops off here at about Mach 0 0.84, 0 0.85 with the prop fan is that, that supersonic tips. Okay. Okay, so, um, an engine choice, and we'll go back to our engine choices. And we remember very briefly, we talked about the difference between a long range aircraft and a short range aircraft and the engine choices that were made in commensurate eras of technology. So the 747-400 and the F-100 were designed and developed at about the same time in the late 1980s, early 1990s, but they have very different engines. The 747 had a bypass ratio in the four and a half to five range, while the, uh, the F-100 in the three range. That's a significant difference. It's one and a half times. Why is this the case? And that's that trade between how you're operating the aircraft. So if you're operating a shorter range, you wanna climb quickly, cruise for as much of that shorter range as possible and descend. You're willing to pay a penalty on in-flight cruise specific fuel consumption to equal out the rest of the mission. The aircraft's also lighter, the engine's lighter, you can carry more payload because it's not fuel limited. And in this case, it's easier to integrate with the infrastructure it was on. On the longer range aircraft, you care more about TSFC. And we see that still to this day for a given level of technology, shorter range aircraft, aircraft whose design mission, original design mission was shorter range, have lower bypass ratio, higher fan pressure ratio engines that have a higher cruise TSFC versus longer range have these heavier, larger bypass ratio, lower cruise TSFC uh, engines. Now, in most cases, we don't see the difference on an aircraft. The airframer wants it to be as close as possible. If you're a Boeing or you're an Airbus, you don't want your engine choices to significantly affect the way your aircraft behaves, how you have to do mission planning, like you want it to be as identical as possible. If you're an airline, you want that variability because you want to be able to choose your engine. And the best example of that within an aircraft, other than you can see it here, is the Trent versus GE90 on the um, 777. So four airlines that fly Boeing 777, slightly shorter distances, the Trent 800 series was a more popular choice. Why is that? Is it because the engine was lighter? It had a lower cruise TSFC, a higher fan pressure ratio, quicker climb, higher initial cruise altitude, it carried more payload, or it had a lower fuel burn. Now, most of these answers are coupled with another answer. So you answer one, one of the other ones is correct. A lighter engine will usually allow you to carry more payload, at least on shorter range missions. Again, you're not fuel limited, so your fuel burn isn't driving your payload. Also, a higher fan pressure ratio will give you a faster climb rate and also allow you to cruise, at least initially, at a higher altitude because you have less thrust laps. Fuel burn goes with TSFC, so if the engine has a lower TSFC, at least as your mission increases, your, your fuel burn will go down. So what is it? Anybody know what the major difference between the Trent and the GE90 was? 
other than one's a three shaft engine, the other's a two shaft engine. And I will get to the question that just came. So wait, yes. So why is the Trent a lighter engine? What about it makes it a lighter engine? Yeah, it's got a lower bypass ratio. To have a lower bypass ratio means you're moving less air. That means to move less air and generate the same amount of thrust, you have to have a higher fan pressure ratio. So that couples together. That means you have a lighter engine. You can carry more payload on non-fuel limited missions. So you're not well out in the, the max gross takeoff weight. Because it's a higher fan pressure ratio, you can climb faster and cruise higher at the start of your mission. It also means that at least for very short missions, you'll probably burn less fuel, all else remaining equal. It's you get to the longer missions, the GE90, that extra bypass ratio, the extra weight that is accrued through that gives you an advantage. Someone has a question. Does competition for engine choice try to drive down cost? How would they decide who they commissioned to build engines? For example, the A380 had a Rolls option and an engine alliance option. And what happens when they work in partnership? Okay, so engine choice is a really, really kind of complicated thing. Early aircraft, early jet aircraft didn't have an engine choice. With the Comet, you had to have Rolls-Royce turbojets. With the initial 707, you had to have Pratt Whitney turbojets. With the initial DC-10, it was only CF-6s, RB-211s for the L-10. Over time, due to airlines, British Airways insists on buying, buying Rolls-Royce. So when they bought 707s, they wanted a Rolls-Royce option. Over time, we saw an increase in engine choices. And at the height, there were typically three different engine options for given aircraft. So if you think about the Boeing 767, you had the choice of the GE CF-6, the Pratt & Whitney, either JT-9D for early ones, or the PW-4000 for later models, and the Rolls-Royce RB211. Same with the 747-400 and the like. The 777 was really the last of that era. You had three relatively new engines. The Trent 800 and the GE90 were relatively, were pretty much total new designs. GE90, very much. GE had never built an engine like that. Rolls, it was an evolution of the RB211. The PW4000 was a bit more of a derivative engine. The problem with having three engines on an airframe is every engine manufacturer is likely to lose money. And in the original 777, if you just looked at that program, every single one of the engine manufacturers lost money. The one that came out closest to making money on it just on the program was Rolls on the Trent 800. Now, they also had other Trent programs that they shared technology with, so it doesn't look so bad. And the GE90 has now allowed General Electric to build the Gen X, and they're making a lot of money, or were making a lot of money on that engine. So, but they all lost money. So there was an agreement when it came time to develop the 787 that Boeing would only have two engines on that as an option. And the question was, which two engines? And Boeing originally had, they got took bids from Pratt and Rolls-Royce and GE. And then what they did is they worked the engines down through back and forth with the manufacturers. So they were as close to identical as possible. In fact, Boeing wanted to allow a lesser or an aircraft owner to swap out engine types over like a two day period. So you could come in and say, you know, I bought this aircraft, it came with GE engines, I'm a Rolls Royce airline, let me swap it out. Never got to that. It's still a much more deep in depth work process, but it's a lot easier to do than it was say on a 777 or 767. And what they did, they chose Rolls Royce and then they had a compete off between Pratt Whitney and GE. And they came down to how much money the one engine manufacturer was willing to offer Boeing. So that's why. Has any plane been built with two different engines on the same body for experimentation? Or is that too risky, practically comparing in flight? Okay, so are we talking about test aircraft where you have an existing engine and an engine under test? And we do that actually all the time. So when Rolls or GE or Pratt tests an engine, they put it on invariably, it's an old 747, different, 747s for the different ones. And they fly with three of whatever that air, seven, four, version of 747 has engines and then their new test engines. So we do it for that. But there's no aircraft that's ever been certified to fly with two different engine types at the same time. It just doesn't make any sense. Okay, so then why do we see 
um, partnerships. Well, every modern engine is ends up probably being a risk sharing partnership. In the case of the GE90, um, Snecma, Saffron was a risk sharing partner. In the case of the A320 engines, the not the Neo, the A3, the standard A320 engines, you had the CFM56 from CFM International and the IAE V2500 from International Aero Engines. Well, CFM International is a 50-50 joint venture between General Electric of the US and Snecma Saffron of France. IAE was originally a joint venture between Rolls-Royce, Pratt & Whitney, MTU, and Mitsubishi. It's since changed hands and Rolls-Royce has divested their share of it, but they were all joint ventures. Same with the Engine Alliance um, engine on the A380. And that was because the Engine Alliance, both GE and Pratt knew if they developed a brand new engine by themselves for the A380, they'd lose their shirts. So they combined technologies from their PW4000 and the GE90 to create that Engine Alliance. Okay. Uh, would, question, would flying with three engines on the 747 test bed negatively impact its takeoff and climb performance? And could you compensate for this? Uh, yeah, it would um, in a lots of ways. They don't fly it fully loaded. It's designed, these flights are planned for this. In fact, what's really funny is GE developed an engine for regional jets, the um, CF, uh, CF 34-10 series, which you can find on the Embraer 190, not the 190E2, the 190 series. And testing that out, that engine produces about 20,000 pounds of thrust. And excuse me, because it's that's the number I remember, not in kilonewtons. Um, and of course, a 747 uh, engine, typically they produce for a 747 400, would produce at takeoff uh, three times that amount of thrust. So obviously they're flying you this tiny little engine on the inboard engine pylon and then the other end on the one wing and the other three engines are that. But they do compensate for that. You'll, you'll take off with one of the other engines derated, the matching engine derated and the like, and you're not at max gross takeoff weight. So there's no risk. You're anywhere at the performance envelope. Um, why did they choose the MD-11's engines? How did that work in terms of the nacelle needed for the wing engine and compared to the engine embedded in the empennage? Ah, the MD-11 is a really interesting one. So when Douglas, McDonnell Douglas decided to design the MD-11, they wanted an aircraft that was a little bit bigger than the DC-10. And same size as the A330-300, A340, and this yet the Boeing 777 hadn't been launched at that point. But they wanted to do it without spending a whole lot of money on research and development. So they did some minor modifications to the wing and they put the larger engines on. So we've moved from engines that were in the 30 to 45,000 pound thrust class to the 50 to 55 to 65,000 pound thrust class, which means they're a higher bypass ratio, larger diameter. It turns out they did a lot of research on it because redoing that number two engine, the engine that's up in the tail, redoing that and inlet would have been very, very cost prohibitive. And it turns out that they could get about the same efficiency using the DC-10-40 engine uh, de inlet design. So they reuse that. So there was a, a penalty, an efficiency penalty, a loss in that inlet over the wing engines in terms of, of that. So you did get a little bit of thrust loss or a little bit of fuel burn penalty for the same thrust, but it worked fairly well. It was a nice balance. And you see that with any engine installation where you have a difference in the way it's installed. So the underwing engines on the DC-10 versus the tail engine, or even more so the underwing engines on the L-1011 versus the fuselage engine, which is buried with an S-duct, or the, the outboard engines on the 727 versus the center engine. You see that, you get a loss. In the case of the 727, it was about 20% um, in some conditions thrust loss. But more likely, it was that the engine was going to perform. You had more, a high, much higher rate of compressor stall and the like, and you had to have a, a better tuned engine. So it was really always a, a challenge to pick the right engine to install on the center versus on the outside. Okay. Uh, question Does the design of the engine cowl, they are we talking, uh, actually help with reducing vibrations or aerodynamics? So, in engine nacelle design and cowl design is, is an art and a science. There's a lot of work that goes into it. So of course, let's go look at these. We have different designs. So let's start here with the original 737-100. This is a really loud installation. You did not have any acoustics or dampening on the exhaust. 
it was a clean solid inlet so there was no liner here um, that it would absorb uh, sound you can see that kind of here that lighter or darker gray is the acoustic liner in fact you had doors that opened up to allow more airflow in if the no inlet got choked and that was in the sense the kind of default over time we've done things like add acoustic liners here for fan and compressor noise we've changed the way we do our exhaust to allow more mixing and the like to do slower um, slow down the the airflow, um, or in the case of the 787 and some GE engines, the CF 34-10, uh, they've put chevrons on the exhaust, both the fan exhaust and the core exhaust in some cases, to reduce noise. Now, that doesn't come for free. There is a penalty associated with that. These chevrons disturb that exhaust flow increase the, the, the slow the air down and you get a loss. If we had a clean, you know, symmetric, smooth ex exit, we would have less of a loss. The trade is how much of a loss to achieve the same noise, how much of a loss do you get from this versus say from changing the fan pressure ratio, a non-optimal fan pressure ratio, like was used on the A380 engines. And this was felt by Boeing and General Electric and Rolls Royce, Boeing and General Electric, who developed these independently about the same time, at, for that level of technology to be a better trade than what, what they did on the A380, which again, it was about a 2% fuel burn uh, TSFC penalty in cruise. And that's a massive loss. And that's one of the reasons the A380 is just not a competitive aircraft. The other reason is it's way too big. It's just not properly sized for the market. Um, it was built as a vanity project. No, airline air framers do that all the time. Some work out well, 747, some not so well, and you get these situations. Okay. For your design, you need to consider how you're going to use the aircraft. If you're designing a mom aircraft, where do you think you want to put your engines? Would you put them on the fuselage or under the wings? And why? Anybody want to hazard some thoughts on that? Yeah, most likely we're going to put them under the wing. The aircraft is relatively large. It's likely to fly in and out of airports that have lots of facilities, jet bridges, lots of air stairs, lots of ground support equipment. And it's just easier to maintain. We can generally put higher bypass ratio engines under the wing. Not that there's anything about the fuselage that prohibits that. The wing's lighter, the fuselage is lighter. It's a good trade. If you're designing a business jet, you're probably going to want to put them on the back. I don't expect you to do a lot of research into how closely coupled your engines are, but do recognize that the trend is they're closer to the wing overall under the wings than they have been in the past. So if we were to look, you know, at the way the engines look, they have moved as they go to higher bypass ratios up and closer to the wing, like this A330 Neo, what is now the A330 Neo or the 787 over what was done in the past. Okay. Anybody have any questions about the process of choosing and selecting a propulsion system and the installation of it for your, your aircraft, your design? Do we need a bigger rudder if the engines are further away? Yep, all else remaining equal, the further out along your wing your engines are, the bigger your asymmetric thrust, the more of a loss, an L over D penalty you'll have because when you lose it because of the bigger rudder that's needed to counter that. In fact, the rudder on all twin engine aircraft is sized for that engine out situation. They're actually too big for the normal things. And you get all sorts of yaw damper and, and Dutch roll issues and stuff like that. And sometimes if the yaw damper isn't working right near the back of some of these long aircraft, you kind of feel it swerving back and forth side to side because that vertical stab 
and the associated rudder are too big. DC-10 rudder is a perfect example of a rudder that's basically too small for its design. It has a double hinged rudder to try to get that capability for the engine out. It is a compromise. It was specific to that aircraft, but if you didn't have that center engine, you wouldn't have needed that rudder. It wouldn't have been the same way. You would have more space. So that is a, a compromise, not necessarily a bad compromise, but it is a compromise of that design. Any other questions? Ah, why are some circular and some not? The best example of the non-circular inlet, don't say non-circular engine, is the original 737, uh, what they call classic, not Jurassic. Um, and all 737s are this way now. Um, the reason for that has to do with ground clearance. So what they've done on most engines, there's accessories underneath the engine. They've moved those to the side and they flatten that. They've also flattened the lip, which does have an effect on the inlet, on um, the airflow in the inlet. It can cause uh, instabilities and the like, but these are well studied. If you look at the Trent uh, 700 on the A330, plane, not Neo, you'll see it also has a flattened nacelle, not necessarily a flattened inlet. So this aircraft had a flattened inlet. It isn't circular, uh, but the engine itself obviously is circular because otherwise it wouldn't work. And that's why we do it. Um, it is a trade to be made, but all thing else remaining equal for that design of the aircraft, it's the best option. Doesn't mean it's the best option. Globally, it's for that aircraft design. Okay. Any other questions? What are the small wings for engines? So um, you can see it here on this 737 uh, engine. And let me find a, another one. Um, here on this one, it's there on that one. We don't have one on this engine. What that has to do, it has to do with the airflow at high angles of attack and how it goes around the wing and it generates a vortex and it just makes it cleaner and more efficient. Um, for a long time, you'd either have one on the outside or one on the inside, not both, because McDonnell Douglas had a patent on having two and it was finally when that patent expired that they started putting them out. But it is part of the engine installation and just maximizing the efficiency, specifically at higher angles of attack of that installation. Okay, it's no different than having vortex generators on the wing or on the flaps or the like. Uh, is it difficult to choose the style of the reversers? Okay, so yeah, so a reverser style here, there are two basic types of reversers that we see. There is the bucket type, and this is a bucket type here, and there is the translating type, which slides aft. It's, it, is, it is basically one of those options. It's what's best for the design of your aircraft and the combination of stuff. We tend to see more bucket type reversers when we have what's called a mixed flow turbofan, where inside the nacelle, we mix the core and the fan exhaust. So examples of mixed flow turbofans include the uh, RB211-524 on the 747, 400s, um, the Trent 700s, on the A330s and examples of the separate flow or like the 787, the, <coughs> the GE90 and Rolls-Royce and the 787 or this. In general, there isn't a one or the other, um, but we do see more of that translating cowl than those buckets. Obviously these old engines like on the 737 use buckets more often. We can see a stream of air, especially on takeoff around these, um, these little wings the vortex generators. And yeah, that's the vortices they're generating. So you have a low pressure area, it's condensing. You see it the same thing off the edge of flaps and stuff on takeoff and landing. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, I will see you on Thursday. Um, we're gonna have a little bit of a talk on Thursday before um, we start the session because we're moving into the configuration design and some stuff about that um, and the like. I will post this video. Um, one one person said, just one more thing, Rolls-Royce engines on 767s were pretty unique to BA. I believe um, 
I don't know if anybody else had them on the six sevens. On the four sevens, they were also fairly unique to BA. BA and Qantas were the only ones that operated. Um, yeah, they did pay a lot of money. Uh, Boeing would not have given that to them for free. Um, and especially in the case of uh, BA, it was probably a package deal on their four seven four hundreds and their seven six seven three hundreds. Um, but yeah, they paid for it. But it was they needed it. There wasn't much of a choice at the time. So okay. Thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon.